you to catch trial on behalf of the state. William J. for the state. James Owens for Sarah Boone. I do. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Boone, good afternoon. If you could please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me. Sarah Boone, 10-10-7-7. Okay, we're here on several different matters, including a motion to su uh, suppress. Specifically, the motion to suppress defendant's statements at OCSO filed September 24, 2024. The amended motion to suppress defendant's statements at OSC or OCSO filed September 30, 2024. And then just what was filed this afternoon at 2.35 p.m., defendant's second amended motion to suppress defendant's statements at OCSO. Uh, State, have you had the opportunity to review the second amended motion? Are you ready to proceed on that today? Okay, are there any housekeeping matters we need to address from the state side of the ledger? Not on that motion. Okay, uh, any housekeeping matters on your side of the ledger, sir, with regard to those motions to suppress? No, sir, Judge, I believe we've got two detectives outside to testify, and we've also got the custodian of records from the Orange County Sheriff's Department relating to the Miranda card and the policy. Is that a valid argument that you're still embarking on this afternoon based on what's in your second amended motion? Yes. Okay, so the, the um, sufficiency of the Miranda waiver is still at play? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. Um, with regard to the other motions that were set for today, the, and I have reviewed the state's motion to strike, and I have reviewed all of the case law authorities that y'all have provided to me as well. With regard to the defendant's motion for hair, cosmetics, civilian and clothing without restraints for trial, Mr. J, do you have any position with regard to the restraints at trial portion of that motion? I believe the law of the case is our Okay, all right, we'll entertain argument when we get there. And I've also reviewed the state's request for protective order filed September 30, which is also set to be heard this afternoon. Uh, with that, uh, we'll begin with the motions to suppress. State, you can call your first witness. Judge, uh, I'm not objecting to the authenticity of whatever it is he subpoenaed. I've been getting some of the documents, um, Orange County Sheriff's Office General Order uh, 711. Um, I don't see any need to belabor the custodian of records sitting around um, something else you Miranda card or yeah something if, you, if you if you look uh, in the very back if you look in the very back okay you see the Miranda card the last page is next to the last page yeah there's no need to keep the custodian of records around for authenticity we, we still have our objection Okay, all right. Can the custodian then be released by virtue of the state's stipulation as to that, uh, those records? Yes, can I get that? Yes. I also have reviewed the two hour and six minute um, investigation that's pertinent to, a, to the motion to suppress. The court has reviewed the entire video. With that state, you may proceed. I think with uh, ask the court for the clerk to mark A for identification to the DVD, first copy, and body on camera. And I have reviewed all of those in advance of today's hearing. Any objections? No objection. What was pre-marked as states A will be received into evidence without objection as states one.
Good afternoon, ma'am. Could you state your full name for the record and spell it for us? Yes, Chelsea Castle. C H E L S E Y. Last name is K O E C S E L L. Thank you, Councilor Your Main Court. Thank you. Where do you work, ma'am? The Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what do you do for Sheriff Mina? I am a homicide. How long have you been a homicide detective? Uh, six years. And what's your total experience with the Orange County Sheriff's Office in terms of years? Uh, I am going on 12 years. Any prior law enforcement experience prior to joining uh, the Sheriff's Office? And in the homicide unit, how is it that you get notified that you shall be the lead investigator on a case? Uh, so, for this case specifically, my team was on call that week for homicides. And so, on the scene, to notify the call center, to notify the on call homicide. Team. All right. And is it fair to say that you guys have three teams of four? Yes. And each of the third weeks, you will be on call? And then through some other random distribution, it's determined who of the four will be the lead. Correct. And it was your turn to investigate the death of Jorge Torres. Yes. And you were notified of this on February 24th of 2020 in the afternoon. Yes. About what time were you notified? I would have to look at the cat sheet to recall directly, but I would assume within 30 minutes to an hour of deputies being on scene. All right, and do you go to the scene first or do you do anything else? Um, for this particular incident, I got my partner, Detective Sarah Lowen, and uh, we headed out to the scene. All right, and when you got to the scene, what did you do? Uh, I met with um, the deputies there and they kind of just briefed me on what was going on and what they responded to. Did you do a walkthrough of the scene? I did, yes. And then was a search warrant drafted for the residence? Yes. And later executed? Correct. Did you have any contact with somebody identified to you as Sarah Boone on the scene? Yes. Do you see Sarah Boone in the courtroom today? I do. Can you point out where she is and what she's wearing? Uh, she's right here on my left, and she's wearing blue. May the record reflect she's identified the defendant? Record will still reflect. When did you first have contact with her? If I'm not mistaken, she was outside of the apartment when I got there. Um, so once I spoke with deputies, I then went and introduced myself to her. All right, and did you ask her any questions at this time as you guys are standing outside of the residence? Not like detailed questions about like what happened because I've already was told by um, deputies what she had told them. Um, so it's more just to like introduce myself and to let her know, you know, we're doing a search warrant and procedures of how um, we do things. And when you respond to a scene, uh, do you respond in plain clothes? Uh, I do, yeah, like business professional. Like what you're wearing? Yes. And when you made contact with her outside of her residence for this first contact, um, were you alone or was your partner Scott Lowen with you? Um, I believe Scott was with me. And was he also similarly dressed in business casual? Yes. All right. And so how long was this initial interaction with Ms. Boone? Not long, um, maybe a couple minutes to a few minutes. Okay. And this was out on the sidewalk in front of uh, her home? Um, yes, if I'm not mistaken, she was at a neighbor's um, residence, like sitting out on their like front porch area. You call what you asked her in this initial contact? Do I recall what? You asked her? No. Okay. So it was just a couple of minutes that you were there with her? Yeah. Okay. And then what do you do after your first contact with her? Um, so once I did my walkthrough, we decided to go with a search warrant for the scene. Um, so that was written by somebody else. And then once that was executed, um, we went in there further with uh, CSIs. And then um, we talked to um, Brian Boone, which was the ex-husband. And then um, I believe we then sat there and went to, the, to our unmarked vehicle and had a conversation with her. Was that conversation in the unmarked vehicle recorded? Yes. Audio. And can you describe this unmarked vehicle for the court? 
Um, at the time, I was in a unmarked Pathfinder, so it was like gray in color. Didn't look like it didn't say like law enforcement or police or anything on the exterior. Um, and there were lights like in light inside. Where did everybody sit in this Pathfinder? I sat in the driver's seat. Sarah sat in the front passenger seat, and Detective Scott Lowen sat in the back seat. Did you have any conversation with her about the facts of the case or your investigation that wasn't recorded inside the car? No. And that was all recorded and turned uh, over to the state attorney's office? Yes. And you announced the date and time of the start of this interview at, on that recording, did you not? Okay. Is it fair to say uh, that it had been about three or four hours since the initial call out for a 911? Yeah, I would say, yeah, because I believe we started interviewing her right before 5 p.m. And is there any particular reason for executing the search warrant and speaking to another witness or witnesses prior to interviewing Ms. Boone? Um, just based off the, the situation and what was happening. Okay. Is it in any way unusual uh, to gather evidence before talking to the last person to see a decedent alive? Um, at some point during this day, which was February 24th of 2020, uh, was her cellular phone device collected? It was. And when was that? That same day. I mean, when time-wise in, in relation to talking to her? Oh, um, well, I noticed the phone was in the kitchen area, um, but I didn't touch anything until CSI's um, documented everything, photographs. And, um, so I don't think I really touched it until after I had talked to her about going through it. All right. And ultimately, uh, was she placed under arrest on February 24th, 2020? No. After she got out of her car, was uh, she free to remain on the scene or free to leave? Yeah. I go back in her house. Prior to that, had she been detained and requested not to leave the scene? Prior to your interview with her in the car, uh, had she been asked or ordered to stay on the scene? Not by me. Okay. Um, February 25th, was there a second interview uh, conducted with you and Detective Lowen with Ms. Boone? Yes. Prior to this interview, had her phone been extracted by any member of the digital forensics team at the Sheriff's Office? Yes. All right, and had you reviewed some of the evidence on there? You had uh, requested that Ms. Boone come down to the sheriff's office rather than you returning to the scene? Yes. Can you explain that? Um, it's more of a controlled setting for law enforcement. Um, we we're able to audio and video record at the sheriff's office. And um, she had mentioned that she might not be staying at her apartment. And so I didn't want to go to the ex-husband's residence where her potential child was. So I just felt it was a more controlled setting at the sheriff's office. All right. And when Miss Boone arrives at the sheriff's office, um, who goes down to greet her and where? It was not me. Um, but she would have gone in through, um, we have two entryways. Um, so either on the record side or um, on the opposite side. Um, and she would have to go up to the window and request that she was there to meet with me. They would call me. I would tell them, yes, sign her in. Um, and then if I'm not mistaken, I believe Scott, uh, Detective Lowen went down and got her. All right. So you're describing two separate entrances that members of the public can come and go through? Yes. As opposed to separate entrances that might be in the back of your building where people are not free to come in and out of without a swipe card. Yeah. All right. Now, in relationship to those two entrances, which are assumed are on the first floor of the building, is that a safe assumption? Yes. Where are the CID or the investigation division's interview rooms? They are located upstairs. All right. And um, is she allowed to just walk up to the second floor interview room, or does she have to be with an employee of the sheriff's office? She would have to be with an employee of the sheriff's office. In your testimony is it wasn't you? I don't believe now tell us about these interview rooms. Uh, we have 
four interview rooms that are audio and video recorded. Okay. And they have, uh, you said they're video recorded. Was the interview with Ms. Boone video recorded by uh, the Sheriff's Office equipment? Yes. Was there any conversation about the case or the investigation with her that did not occur inside that room with the recording going? No. Okay. I don't have other questions of this witness. Thank you. Any cross examination? Yes. Detective, I'm James Owens. I met you outside just, just a few minutes ago, and you know I, I represent Sarah Boone. Detective, have, have you had a chance to review any paperwork related to this case prior to this hearing? I have looked at my investigative report, and I have looked at some policies, but they were from current. Have you had a chance to view uh, Deputy Kayla Rodriguez's body cam video prior to today? I've seen it. I have not seen it recently. Have you had a chance to review and listen to the audio interrogation that was in the unmarked vehicle that you did of Sarah Boone on the day in question? Yes, I have reviewed that. And have you had a chance to review the approximate two-hour uh, interrogation video at the Orange County Sheriff's Department? Yes. Would it be fair to say that prior to you asking Sarah Boone to enter this unmarked vehicle for this interrogation with Detective Lowen, that you did a preliminary investigation as to whether or not uh, this was potentially a homicide? Yes. And you would have viewed the scene inside the apartment? Yes. And you would have spoken to Deputy Rodriguez about what she knew about the situation? Yes. And you would speak to Deputy Rodriguez about what Sarah Boone had said had happened? Correct. And did you talk to any other people there about the situation prior to speaking with Sarah Boone about the facts in this case? Uh, just Brian Boone. Okay. And was that conversation recorded with Brian Boone? Yes. And would that have been in your squad car? Potentially. I didn't listen to that interview. Okay. I don't know if we interviewed him outside or in my car. Was he Mirandized? No. Okay. So although he was at the scene when y'all showed up, he was not considered a suspect or person of interest? No. At some point, did you determine that Sarah Boone was a suspect or person of interest? At some point, yes. Tell, tell us when that happened. Uh, the next day. Okay, so at the time of this event, your initial appearance there at the, uh, at the scene, which I understand you, you must have stayed four or five hours? Probably. Okay. At that point, at no time, did you all consider Sarah Boone a suspect? Well, it's difficult to the way you're asking, but she was the only one there. She's claiming that no one else was there. So what I was being told um, would mean that she was the only person of interest in that situation. But due to um, not having uh, the autopsy results, we just interviewed her initially, got her initial statement. And then pending, once the autopsy was completed the next morning, was when um, I already knew I was going to meet with her again to discuss the autopsy results. So then um, we had another interview with her where she was Mirandized and she went to jail later that evening. And while you were there on scene, I know at some point you saw her phone on the kitchen counter. I did. All right. Or and, on the microwave. It was somewhere in the kitchen. All right. And at some point you went to Sarah Boone and you asked her for the password to open the phone. We asked um, to go through her phone. Did you, did you ask Sarah Boone, can I have the password so I can go through your phone? Yes, after she signed the consent form. Okay, so not before? You didn't ask her before you asked her to sign the consent form? Sarah, give me the password to your phone. Not that I recall, but why would I would normally have her sign the consent form first 
for her consenting to go into the phone and then gather the passcode or whatever it is. Well, how would that have even come about then? I mean, how would you have approached her about signing the waiver to consent to searching the phone? She called 911. So I told her that we needed to corroborate her story as to what occurred. Okay. And so to do that, um, I wanted to go through her phone. All right. Do you know about what time she signed the consent? No, I don't think it requires a time on there. But it was when we were on the scene initially. Was it prior to her interrogation in the unmarked vehicle? Yes. And after uh, she signed the consent, did you, your your testimony is you you asked her for her password and she gave you her password after signing the consent to search the phone? Yes, I didn't touch the phone until I did. All right. Uh, you're talking about the digital investigator yes. and they have the ability to open up the phone and search the phone? With or without a password, yes. But y'all utilize the password that Sarah had given, had you not? I believe so. Okay. And do you know how long it took for the digital investigator to show up after you arrived? Oh, yeah. She didn't come until later. Um, I believe around 7 p.m. Okay. This one in the CAD sheet. And you know there were two two videos on Sarah's phone. After I spoke to Sarah. I'm sorry? After I spoke to Sarah. All right. So what I what I'm gathering from what you just said is um, at some point you asked or directed Sarah Boone into your unmarked vehicle where you interrogated her. Is that correct? Where we Sir. And your testimony is that you did not view the videos that were found on her phone. And I'm, I'm referring to the two minute video of George in the suitcase. And then some time went by and I think there was about a 22 second uh, video of George in the suitcase that Sarah took of him in the suitcase. Your testimony is prior to you putting her in your unmarked vehicle that you did not, you were not aware of those two videos. That's correct, sir. I did not go her phone until digital forensics came out and then went into her phone and then she brought me over to her van to tell me about the videos and what she found. All right so your testimony is at the time that uh, Sarah Boone was interviewed in your vehicle that the forensic phone investigator had not arrived? Correct. Okay. Did you tell Sarah I know we saw the audio once you get in the car, but did you talk to Sarah before y'all got in the vehicle? Of course. And did you tell Sarah that y'all wanted to talk to her and this was routine protocol? Yeah, that I wanted to have a conversation with her. And once, the, once I had walked through the house and saw what I was working with, we would have that conversation. Did you tell her that interviewing her in the squad car was routine protocol to your investigation? I don't recall if I specifically said that, sir. This is 2020. Okay. If she recalled that, would you dispute it? Objection, improper question. Sustained. Your, your testimony is you don't remember saying that? I don't remember specifically saying what one more time. What is it that she claimed that I said? Routine protocol. I would not interview her, not in my unmarked car. So my routine protocol, sure, I would do that. I would okay. interview her in a spot where no one can hear us. And you would explain to her why you were doing that, wouldn't you? Would I explain to her why we were sitting in my car? Yeah. Standing? Yes. No. Well, you would have to tell her something. I said, yes, we're going to go have a conversation in my car now. Okay. And did she have any questions that you recall about what, what's this about? And you could have potentially explained to her that this is routine? It was all explained on the audio recording. Okay. But you, you agree you had a conversation with her before you got into the car with her? Yes, I definitely directed her to get into the front passenger seat when we were going to talk in the vehicle, yes. Okay. And you, and you don't recall whether or not you said this is routine protocol to come into the car and talk to me? Those words specifically, no, okay. but I would have talked to her in the vehicle regardless. I would not have talked to her outside of my vehicle. All right. Now, once inside the squad car, you were there with the other detective, Detective Lowen. Okay. 
and you read her the Miranda rights card, correct? Yes, from my card. Yes. Do you do you agree that you didn't you didn't ask her the last question, number nine? Objection, relevance. Response. Judge, we're here on a hearing on on the issue about the interrogation. But, but, oh, the case law that you provided to me, none of it stands for the proposition. Miranda identifies the four things that need to be addressed. Not one of the case, not one of the cases talks about that issue of reading that language at the bottom of the card that is in the motion upon information and belief. This is what it says. So how is it relevant for the purposes of today? Well, it's it's relevant because this is the policy of her department. But Judge what what is the policy? But now we're getting away from the card to now the policy. There's nothing about the policy right now. The question is about what the card says. Okay. The card is the policy, and the policy is the policy. They're intertwined. Uh, they refer to each other. Um, our argument is that she did not waive her rights but to that's remain a, silent. But that's a different issue than what is on the card. I understand, but it's a coercive question about her not doing that, which was the policy of her sheriff's department. She elected not to do that. She wanted a statement from Sarah Boone at the scene. She wanted a statement from Sarah Boone at the Sheriff's Department. She elected not to answer a question that the policy says read verbatim from the car. Why did she not want it? Our position is it was an attempt by this detective to coerce Sarah Boone into talking. On February 24th or on February 25th? On February 25th, this, this interrogation ties into that one. She used the same routine protocol that she used for the second one. The first one, she claims that my client wasn't a suspect, wasn't a person of interest. At the Sheriff's Department, I'm sure, I haven't talked to her about it yet, but I'm sure she's gonna say, yes, she was a suspect. Yes, she was a person of interest. Yes, we had probable cause to arrest her prior to her giving a statement. But what she said, in terms of routine protocol, the day before was what Sarah was relying on when she said routine protocol, when she questioned the detective about routine protocol the very next day in the interrogation room. And for her not to give that question goes to the totality of the circumstances as to whether or not my client, Sarah Boone, actually waived her right to remain silent. If she understood her rights, and then she consciously and freely waived her rights. She was not asked that question. She was not asked that question in the car. She was not asked that question. But that totality of the circumstances comes into play for the court to consider, this court or an appellate court to consider, as to whether or not that statement should be suppressed. Any other response? Judge, just like it's irrelevant what the sheriff's office policy is compared to what the Florida case law says about our right to not be compelled to give statements under our constitution in the state of Florida, or the United States and federal case law and the state case law interpreting the United States Constitution, the policy is irrelevant and the officer's subjective intent is completely irrelevant in a motion to suppress, just like it would be in a traffic stop under Wren versus United States. What matters is objectively what was spoken to the defendant. And I would ask that we honor the local administrative order and call people by their surnames and not their first names. Um, what matters is that the defendant was read what the case law requires. Anything about the policy, anything about the officer's subjective intent is completely outside of all the case law submitted by both the parties. Right. Last bite at the apple. I'm sorry. Last bite at the apple. Last bite at the apple. Any other argument? Judge, we're, we're talking about the totality of the circumstances, whether it was coerced or not. Well, you can take any technique or a non-technique, something that you use or don't use, to establish whether or not it was coerced or not. The fact that she didn't read, do you understand the rights? Do you understand these rights, which is the form, the Miranda warning form? Do you wish to talk to us at any time? That's, that's on the waiver affidavit. On the other form, which is the policies form, it says, do you understand these rights? And then the question number nine, do you wish to talk to us at this time? Objections overruled. Thank you. And you're referring about surname. What do you mean by that? You mean uh, that, that means last name. 
Okay, what, what did I say? Just keep calling the defendant by her first name. All right. Can I say Sarah Boone? Either Miss Boone or Sarah Boone, that's okay. fine. You may proceed. <clears throat> Have you had a chance to look at the standardized Miranda card issued by the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Do you agree that you did not read the nine questions to her in your squad car? All nine questions? Is Correct. No, not, no. Not. Do you know how many questions you did read to her? Eight. Okay. And the, the question you omitted, omitted is question number nine. Is that correct? Yes, it's actually not on my memory card. I'm sorry? It's not on my memory card. What, what do you mean by that? It was the card that you read, it was not on the card? The Miranda card? We have multiple Miranda cards at the sheriff's office, but yes, that is the policy. In reference to the policy, yes, it is the policy. Well, somebody dropped the ball somewhere. Did you did you fail to Sorry, get proper question sustained? Did did you fail to get the most updated card or how did that happen that the ninth question was not on your Miranda rights card? I've had that card since I started being a sex offenders in 2015. Have, have you become aware as it relates to following this motion? I've become more aware, yes, of the oh. standard exact card. Have you gone and gotten the updated card? Objection relevance. Dane. <clears throat> When y'all took her phone, detective, did you tell Sarah Boone that you would be returning to her apartment the following afternoon to give her her phone back? No. You did not tell her that? No, I listened to all my interviews, everything that's been audio recorded. No, I did not tell her that. We had plans to meet at the sheriff's office. Or tell me what you understood uh, the conversation was as it relates to her getting her phone back. I'm sure she asked when she would be getting her phone back, and I didn't give her a detailed timeline. I said that, um, I don't even know if I told her that we, I decided to write a search warrant on it because I don't need to tell her that. It's evidence in a crime. I'm allowed to take it, so I took it, and I wrote a search warrant for it. Okay, but you, you don't recall ever having a discussion with Sarah Boone about when you were going to return her phone? Specifically returning her phone, no. Okay. Do you recall her calling you later that evening on your cell phone? From, from her husband's phone? You don't recall that conversation? She called you later that evening? Do you have documentation of the phone call? I have her testimony. Oh, okay. Well, I don't recall the phone conversation. Excuse me? I do not recall the phone conversation. Right. You said that y'all had some discussions about Sarah Boone coming to the station. Was that talked about the day of this event or the next day with Sarah Boone? It was talked about before I left the scene. All right. And did you relate to Sarah Boone that she needed to come to the Sheriff's Department the next day to retrieve her phone? I don't know if I specifically told her about retrieving her phone she knew that I was waiting to hear about autopsy results and that I would probably have more questions. All right, so you, you, you believe you told her that night, I need you to come back, maybe or maybe not about the phone, but I've, I may have some more questions for you? Something along those lines. Okay. And when was it that you actually saw the two videos from Sarah's phone? Was it that evening after the interrogation in the squad car? Yes, it was happening during the day. All right, and was it while you were on scene? Okay. And did you attempt to talk to Sarah again about that at that time? No. Okay. And so did you let your detective uh, partner know about the, the videos on Sarah's phone? Objection relevance. No. Overruled. Did you let your partner know about that evidence? Okay. And did y'all discuss that issue? Objection relevance or product. Sustained. 
at some point y'all had to, were, were y'all working together or were you making all the calls or were y'all making joint decisions? Sustained. Ma'am? There's no, there's no pending question at this time, ma'am. At some point, did you form an opinion as to whether you had probable cause to arrest Sarah Boone? Overruled. Yes, at some point. Did you make that decision by yourself or was it collectively made by others with the department? Sustained. You don't need to answer anything. Detective, at what point uh, did y'all that next day, I think you, you had her coming in in the afternoon? I believe it was on Tuesday. Did y'all work on trying to get the search warrant for the phone? I would have to look at the okay. Do you know what time the search warrant came back signed by the judge? Okay. And would it be fair to say that you you told Sarah to come in that later that afternoon or the next day? Yes. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you worked on the case that entire day until Sarah Boone came in? That's why I asked her to come in. All right. And what time was the autopsy that morning? It starts at 8, but I didn't probably end up until 10. It takes quite a few hours. Okay. And were you there alone with the medical examiner, or were there anybody else there? Um, I don't recall if Detective Lowe was with me or not, but yes, of course, there's doctors. Okay. And so in terms of your, your determination as to whether or not Sarah Boone was a suspect. Did she become a suspect after you watched the video, the two videos from her phone the day before the autopsy? Objection relevance. The custody is not disputed on the February 25th statement. How is this relevant? If the issue is knowing an intelligent waiver, the sufficiency of Miranda and coercion, what does the formulation of probable cause have anything to do with anything? Well, I, I wanted to bring out the fact that they had already made a decision before she came in for the interrogation on the 25th that they had probable cause to arrest her. So that if she, A, either didn't come in, they were going to go arrest her that day, or B, if she did come in and she exercised or invoked her rights to remain silent, that they were going to arrest her anyway. That they had already made a decision that she was the prime suspect. They had probable cause. What does cause. that have to do with any of the three issues that are raised in the motions? It's, it's whether or not she was in custodial interrogation, whether she was free to leave. I don't know that that's being disputed by the state. I think my response. That's my understanding. The state's okay. not disputing that there was a custodial interrogation, okay. which is why on February, on February 25th, which is why Miranda was provided prior to that. Judge, it was provided the day before, and she's just testified. Uh, she was free to leave at any time. Okay. So the Miranda was given on two separate occasions. She wasn't in custodial interrogation. Detective, am I right? The day. Well, hang on. Before we ask any questions, let's drill with the, the evidentiary objection first. Okay. The objection sustained. Okay. You may proceed. All right. <clears throat> Ma'am, you would agree that uh, when Sarah Boone arrived that afternoon for the interrogation, she was not free to leave. She was not. Excuse me? Okay. And so if, if she would have remained silent and exercised or invoked her right to remain silent, she would have been arrested anyway. And that was based on your investigation that you had the night before at the scene. It was based on her statements that she had given you in the squad car. And it was based on the autopsy that was performed the next day that you were present for. And it was based on the two videotapes that you saw from Sarah's phone. As to what probable cause basis sustained. You had all that information before you began your interrogation on the 25th of Sarah Boone. I had all that information. All the information that I just related to you before before you began your interrogation of Sarah Boone. On February 25th? That's correct. Yes. And you would agree that you wanted to speak to her on the 25th. 
objection relevance. Overall. Uh, yes. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you wanted to get statements from her relating to the injuries to George Torres from the autopsy? Overall. Yes, I wanted to have a follow-up conversation in reference to what she told me the night before and in reference to the injuries that she failed to mention. And you also wanted to question her about the two videotapes that you had found on the phone? Overall. Yes, I do okay. want to show her the videos. And you agree, in your opinion, the video, the two videos, and the autopsy were inconsistent with the story she had given you in the in the squad car the day before. Objection. Overall. The videos. I'm sorry. Repeat your question one time. You would agree that the autopsy results and the videos that were extracted or taken from her phone uh, recording George. Those two pieces of evidence from your investigation were inconsistent with the statement that she had given the day before in your squad car. Overall. Yes. And I believe that's ultimately the reason you arrested her because of her inconsistencies. Objection. Relevant. Sustained. Now you said you've had a chance to review the interrogation video at the uh, Orange County Jail on February 20, 25th of 2020. The Orange County Sheriff's Office. The Orange County Sheriff's Department. And also, uh, I believe the state attorney had it transcribed. Have you had a chance to read the transcript? I have not read the transcription. I listened to, I watched the video with the audio. Okay, have you had a chance to look at my motion where the question and answers are typed out? Um, at least the first minute or so. No, I've not looked at your Okay. Um, do you recall um, you saying to her, I'm going to have you sit in the green chair? Objection. Best evidence is the recording. He's right. Okay. Objection sustained. Okay. Um, do you agree? Prior to reading Miranda, that you mentioned to her that you had received his autopsy and that you were going to read her her rights again, but that we had to talk about that, referring to the autopsy. Sustained. Do you recall making some comments to her prior to reading her the rights? Overruled. Yes. Is it the policy of the Orange County Sheriff's Department to make any statements to them about the interrogation prior to reading Miranda? Overall. One more time. I assume that's not the first time you've read Miranda to a suspect. Sustained. Let me go back to the first question then. Is it the policy of the Sheriff's Department not to ask any preliminary questions prior to reading Miranda rights? Overruled as relevance. You would have to show me the policy that you're referring to, but I was not asking her any incriminating questions during that time. I was explaining to her the purpose of the interview. Well, have you ever been, you, I, I, knew, I understand you must have undergone some training on Miranda rights and how to interrogate somebody. Sustained. How, how long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? Uh, since 2013. How long have you been a homicide detective? Over six years. Okay. Have you ever been trained or told to ask or not to ask any statements or any questions prior to reading Miranda relating to them talking to you? Sustained. 
Can you tell us if you recall saying anything to her prior to reading her Miranda? I recall talking about, briefly talking about getting the autopsy results and that I wish to have a conversation with her. All right. Do you recall again uh, reading her Miranda rights to her own video? Yes. Do you recall again omitting uh, question number nine on the standardized Miranda rights form for the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Objection. Overruled. I did not ask her question number nine. Okay. Do they have Do they have a Miranda cards form in the interrogation room? So you would have got you would have had that on your person. You may. <clears throat> yes, this is our waivers and affidavits. It's filled out by me, but there's something highlighted that I did not do. We're talking about just this top, right? Okay, I'm sorry. It does it what? Does that form is it filled out as it relates to Sarah Good? In the case, yes. Is that her signature alone? Yes. Did you see her sign it? Yes. Is that your signature below? Yes. And is that the consent for the home? The consent to search, yes. On that form, is there also the recording warnings? Yes. Okay. And that, that is a form that's uh, standardized by the Sheriff's Department? Yes. And you did not re read a Miranda from that, from those rights? From this piece of paper? Yes. That's audio and video recorded? That No. Okay. Do you agree that uh, there's no question? Same objection to the relevance. As far as it being a consent to search her phone, we're not disputing that she was in custody on February 25th, 2020, when she gave a statement to the detectives. And again, under the case law, there's no requirement for this question nine. Under any state case law regarding the Florida uh, state constitutional right to not com be compelled to testify against oneself, nor any federal or state case law regarding the United States Constitution, the Fifth Amendment applied to this state through the 14th Amendment that requires that question to be read. It does not go to the totality of the circumstances of the voluntariness of her uh, waiver from Miranda rights. Your response? Judge, uh, you know, obviously we, we disagree. You know, you've Then where's the case that supports that? Because as I addressed previously, I read all the authorities. I mean, State versus Owens, State v. Thomas, Powell from the United States Supreme Court, which reversed the Florida Supreme Court decision, all talk about what's required by Miranda. And that question number nine that you're focusing on isn't included in any of those. 
I understand that, Judge. The right to remain silent, the right to an attorney, before and after questioning. If you can't afford one, one will be provided to you. Everything you say can and will be used against you. Those are the things that Miranda highlights. That Miranda opinion itself says that. So what does question number nine have anything to do with those things if the state case law and the federal case law, including, including but not limited to Miranda itself and Powell, and then the state case law of Thomas and Owens, all of which were provided either by yourself or by the state, identify what's required, and that's not one of the requirements. She has a duty to read the rights. But they were. I want to finish my argument. Okay. She has a duty to read the rights. She has an obligation to ensure that Sarah Boone understands her rights by asking that question. Do you understand the rights I've just read? And then there must be a waiver. Yes, I understand the rights and I agree to speak to you now. So for that to be freely and voluntarily given, that statement, there must be a conscious waiver of the rights. The problem with the detective is she reads the rights, do you understand the rights, and then she goes right into questioning. She goes right into questioning without saying, do you agree to speak to me? Understanding your rights, do you agree to speak to me now? That goes directly to whether or not it was freely, voluntarily, and knowingly given, the statement and whether that waiver was. So under the totality of the circumstances, I think that evidence is relevant. It's the policy of the Sheriff's Department. Obviously, had, she had an old Miranda rights form, but she failed to read what we perceive as a critical question, and she's going to testify about what she perceived at the time that the detective failed to read that question and how it ties into the case. Um, I understand that all they have to read is those four, but I think under the totality of the circumstances standard that this court has to apply, that that should be a consideration the court should consider. I know it was an honest mistake. She had an old card, but still, I feel like it should be considered in your decision. Anything else, Mr. J? It's essentially the defendant stating that they want to make new case law. I'm going to sustain the objection as relevance by virtue of the decisions in uh, Thomas 351, Southern 3rd 197, and Owens 41, Southern 3rd 352. There's, um, I just, it's not relevant as to what the questions need to be asked for the purposes of whether a sufficient Miranda waiver was given. Do you agree, Detective, that after you read her those Miranda rights, You would agree the situation on the 25th when you were reading her Miranda and about to question her was different from the situation the day before when you read her Miranda in the squad car. Yes, that had more evidence. That was without the autopsy. That was without the two videos from her phone in the squad car. Yeah, I did at the time of the interview. Yes. Yeah. And in the squad car, she was free to leave. I mean, I didn't tell her she was free to leave, but I mean, if she didn't want to talk to me, she didn't have to talk to me. Okay.
That's all the questions I have at this time. Thank you. Any redirect? Nothing. All right. Can this witness be released? I, I'd like you to stay. All right. Subject to recall. Thank you. State, you may call your next witness. No additional witnesses or evidence on this issue, Judge. Okay. All right. Anything from your side of the ledger, sir? Judge, I would like you stipulated to the introduction. No, I don't object to the authenticity. All right. Judge, uh, I would like to introduce maybe more evidence. Just that one. And what is it that's been marked as defense exhibit B? Any objection? Same objection. It's irrelevant. Is it the form as of now, or is it the form as of 2020 when the... Okay. Can I see it for a moment, please? Thank you. Any additional argument with regard to the state's relevance objection? No, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. J, I wasn't specific enough. Uh, Mr. Owens, to you, any additional arguments? Same arguments. All right, I, I'm going to sustain the relevancy objection for the same reasons the court articulated previously. And Mr. Owens, you had one additional exhibit as well. This is a composite exhibit, judges the policy of the sheriff's department. Do you know what page specifically those policies are on? Page 14 of 22. I'll give you two more pages. Is it uh, beginning of paragraph four, waiver of constitutional rights? Yes. Okay, I've read pages 14 and 15. All right, Judge, and then um, you go to 13 of 28. 13? 13. Wait, it's the next. Oh, there's two different sets. It's a composite. Up. My apologies. It's split up. Got it. 13 of 28 at the bottom, P. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to the next page, 14 of 28, specifically 2A on 14.
Anything else? No other argument, Judge, okay. other than what we've talked about. Anything further? Same arguments. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to overrule the objection as to relevance as to what was pre-marked as composite C, and that will be received into evidence over objection as states one. I'm sorry, defense is one. Any further witnesses, evidence, or testimony, sir? Judge, I'd like to call Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone can approach the podium. She was previously sworn at the beginning. Would y'all be here? Yes, sir. Hey, and the deputy's got to move her. <clears throat> Ma'am, you've already been sworn. Counselor, you may proceed. Ma'am, would you please state your full name? Sarah Boone. Well, you're going to have to speak up or move the mic. Sarah Boone. Yes. Where are you currently housed? At the Orange County Corrections Department. Have you been there since February the 25th of 2020? Correct. Was that the date of this interrogation that we're here for on this motion? Yes. All right. Let me take you back to the morning of finding George Torres in the suitcase. You called 911? Is it true that uh, Detective or Deputy Kayla Rodriguez of the Sheriff's Department arrived? Yes. What mental state did you have at that time? I was very confused. Um, it was very hazy. I didn't understand the monumental amount of people that were there and what they were doing with taking things from my home. I was worried about my dogs. Um, I was worried about my son. I was, I was in shock. I was traumatized by the situation and then trying to focus on everything that was going on, on my, at my home. Um, I was hung over. I was still, I believe, intoxicated to a degree. Objection, Judge. Move to strike. This is outside their motion to suppress. They have not made any allegations that her statement was involuntary because of her mental state or state of intoxication. Response? Judge, we're talking about, I'm, I'm just getting some preliminary information. But we're, we're, her, her interrogation is the next day. The state has an obligation, and the case law cited by the state requires specificity okay. in the motions. So it's not a game of 20 questions and a surprise. Okay, okay. this this is are the day you, before the interrogation. I understand that. We're not, we're not talking about an intoxication. But are you going to be arguing anything in conclusion as to what happened on February 24th led to any coercive or coercion behavior on behalf of the Orange County Sheriff's Office on February 25th? Are you going to bootstrap or link any of those things together? The interrogation in the squad car and what was said to her prior to getting in the squad car that relates to what she said about it being routine protocol, yes. All right, I'm going to sustain the state's objection. Relating to the intoxication? Yes. Okay. It wasn't raised in any of the three motions that have been filed. Judge, I didn't ask her that. She volunteered. That. I understand it. Okay. Objection sustained okay. and stricken. All right. Did you speak to the deputy about what had happened? Yes. Okay. And then were you asked to stay on scene? By both, yes. By both detectives, yes. Okay. How long did it take the detectives to arrive 
after you had spoken initially with Deputy Rodriguez? It was not right away. I don't know specifically, but it was not quickly. Okay. Did the detective, the two detectives, when they arrived, did they take over the investigation? Um, it was my understanding, yes. No foundation for her to conclude anything. Sustained. At, at some point, were, were the detectives directing you what to do and where to go? Yes. Okay. Can you explain what the detectives told you as it relates to you getting in, in the car? What, was the phone issue before the car? Yes. Sustained. Was the, let, me, let me ask you about the phone. When were you first asked about your phone? From my remembering, it was once they arrived, one of the first questions that Hope Salt asked me was if I owned a phone. And what did you tell her? I told her it was on the kitchen counter. All right. And what happened next as it relates to the phone? Um, I believe that it was brought to her with someone else. I don't remember. Sustained. What was the next thing that you were told or talked to about as it relates to the phone? Unlock it. Who told you that? Detective Copsell. How did you unlock it? She handed it to me and I unlocked it. How do you unlock your phone? Um, it was uh, with a passcode. Okay. And when you unlocked it, did, she, did, she, did you give it back to the, the detective? I did. All right. Did you ever see the phone again? I did not. Okay. After that incident, uh, was the next time you were spoken to by Detective Copsell was in relation to the interview in the squad car? Yes, she told me I needed to go with her and Detective Lowen to her unmarked vehicle. And did she tell you anything about what was going to take place once y'all got inside the vehicle? That she was just going to be asking me general questions. All right. Was there ever any mention about normal protocol? Not that I can recall. Okay. What about once you got in the squad car? I don't recall the squad car. Okay. And that was recorded for the court to consider. And so she read you your Miranda rights? Yes. All right. Did you answer the questions? I did. Did they ever indicate to you that you were a suspect? No. Did they ever indicate to you that you were a person of interest? No. Did they ever refer to the video uh, videos that you recorded on your phone from the night before? No. Were you ever questioned about those videos at the scene? I was not. All right, after they finished inter interviewing you in the unmarked vehicle, were you allowed to get out? Yes. Were you allowed to leave the scene at that point? I was instructed by those to not. Okay. And how long did you stay on the scene? The entire time. How long, how long was that? How long did it take before the investigation was completed? 10 hours or more. Okay. At some point, did they all leave? Yes. And at some point, did they tell you they were finished with the work there at the scene? Yes. Okay. What did you do? I went inside my apartment and gathered a few things, and then I went to my former husband's residence where my son was located. All right, and how far was that away? About five minutes. How did you get there? I drove. Okay. What was the reason that you wanted to stay over there the night? Because I was terrified of his family. Now, later that evening, you were going to spend the night there with your son and with your ex-husband? Correct. And did you do that? I, my son, yes. All right. Later that evening, did you attempt to contact Detective Copsell? I did. And whose phone did you use? Former husband, Brian Boone. All right. You said your phone had been seized? Correct. And you had consented to that? You signed a form allowing them to take the phone? Yes. Have there been any discussion about returning the phone. Um, Copesville told me she or Lowen or both would return back to my apartment to return my phone. And when did they tell you this? Before they left the scene. 
And did they tell you they would return your phone where? Um, to myself at the apartment. And is that what you understood they were going to do? Yes. Was there ever any talk about you coming to the sheriff's department that the day of this event? All right, so later that evening, you borrowed your ex-husband, Brian Boone's phone and made a phone call. How did you know Detective Copesel's private cell number? She gave it to me before she left the scene. And did you call her? I did. Do you recall about what time you called her? I believe it was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock. And that would have been on February the 24th of 2020? Yes. All right, can you tell us why you were calling her that night? Before she left and giving me her personal cell phone number, um, she told me if I were to recall anything or if I just wanted to talk to her about something regarding the case for me to call her. So I took that to heart and felt very uneasy about how they left the scene. Sustained. Go ahead. Um, there's no pending question at this time. Okay. You, you, were con you were concerned about the case and you wanted to call her? Yes. And did you, did you talk to her? Yes. What did you say to her? I told her in all honesty that I felt that she was trying to trick me. Sustained. Did you have a conversation about your phone? Um, yes. I asked her. Answered. Oh. You may answer the question, ma'am. Did you call for a yes or no? She said yes, and now I don't know if I know what's pending. Did y'all have a discussion about your phone? Yes. Can you elaborate on that discussion? She told me that I needed to come down to the sheriff's department because she was pregnant and asked me if I remembered about when I was being pregnant and it would just be a lot easier for her if I were to arrive at the sheriff's department to pick up my phone. Was there any discussion about you being interrogated at the sheriff's department? No. Was your understanding the sole purpose of you going to the sheriff's department the next day was to pick up your phone? And the sole reason for the change in plans from them bringing the phone to you was because Detective Copsell was pregnant and not feeling well. Correct. So the next afternoon, did you drive to the Sheriff's Department? Okay. Tell us, when you parked your car, where you went, what happened? I parked my car and um, left everything as regular in my car and um, walked through the front door and uh, went to the window asking um, who I needed to see and they, I guess, rang um, them upstairs and Detective Lowen came downstairs and I thought I was supposed to be picking my phone up over at a particular window and he says, no, your uh, phone is upstairs, so we would just like for you to come upstairs and that's where you can pick up your phone. All right. And so did he escort you upstairs? He did. How did y'all get upstairs? In an elevator. And was he, what was he wearing? Um, I believe he was wearing a red shirt um, along with his firearm and black pants. His firearm was on his, on his waist? The entire time, yes. Okay. So y'all got off the elevator. Where did you go from there? Um, he brought me into a small <coughs> room um, and... They had me sit down, and then from there I had a list of things that I was going to ask them that I might need to do or that I could do. Okay. So from the elevator, Detective Lowen escorted you directly into the interview room, and we've got, we've got the recording, the audio and the video. Uh, you didn't go anywhere else no. prior to that time. Was there any discussion that you made outside, any discussion between you and either detective uh, about – Anything, the phone, questioning, anything before walking into that room? No. Okay. So direct, directly off the elevator and walked into the interrogation room. Correct. And then we've got the video on that. Now, you and I have watched the video. Yes. 
Correct. And you've seen the motion where I've referred to the question where she asked you to sit down. Yes. You recall that happening? Yes. Did that refresh your memory watching the video? Yes. Do you recall her saying that she had received the autopsy? Yes. Do you recall her saying, I want to read you your rights again because we have to talk about that, referring to the autopsy? Yes. This was prior to you being read your Miranda rights? Correct. And she also said, we're not done talking about the incident. You recall that? Yes. And then she said, we just have to do it. Yes. How did that make you feel? Sustained. Were you trying to comply with the officer's demands? Objection, Overruled. In every way. Were you trying to cooperate? In every way. Were you polite with them? Very. <coughs> and when she said that, we just have to do it, you said just like we did yesterday. Yes. And then you said normal protocol. Yes. Is that what she had said the day before? Normal protocol. Yes. And she, and she said the same word. Could you, you said normal protocol to her. I was reiterating to her what she had said to me the day before. So she read the Miranda rights to you. Except number nine. Except number nine. She read the rights and then she said, do you understand what I've just read to you? And you agreed that you had, yes. but you were not read having these rights in mind. Do you agree to speak to me now? Overruled. I was not asked that question. Is it fair to say that after she read the Miranda rights and after she said, do you understand the rights that I've just read to you, that she read right into the questioning? She did, correct. So she never got the answer from you. Do you agree to speak to us now? I was never asked that. The way that she acted, the things that she said, the fact that they had your phone. Did you get did you get the impression you were not getting your phone back if you didn't answer the questions? Sustained. She was in custody? Yes. Yeah, it's been conceded by the state. In their response, that it was a custodial interrogation. Okay, but she wasn't aware of it. She wasn't aware she was in custody. What does her subjective perception matter? Well, under the circumstances, it would matter. I mean, she she didn't feel she was free to leave. It, 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 she was in an enclosed small space. Um, she was. That all goes to whether or not. She, let me think. She was being questioned by two lead detectives, homicide detectives. One of them was wearing a firearm. Um, she was trying to cooperate as best she could. I think her, her position is that she was coerced in answering the question. What does that have to do with coercion? Those are all factors that under Ramirez as to whether or not it was custodial. Well, I know some of the factors are whether or not the interrogation actually happens in a police station or not, or whether it happens outside a police station. So just that, just that environment alone. And that goes to whether or not it was a custodial interrogation. Okay. That I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling with the connection on that being non-compliance with Miranda, coercion, or the third ground of voluntariness. Well, I think it, it goes subjectively to her and what she was feeling, if she had a free choice or not, based what's, on what's based the based on subjectivity matter. Excuse me, based what's on subjectivity matter under the case law. Based on based on the circumstances that she was dealing with at the time, whether or not she felt she had a choice. But what does her subjectivity have to do with that? I, I believe it's relevant. 
Objections overruled. I'm sorry, the objection sustained. I apologize. <clears throat> Did you understand you were not going to get your phone back until you answered the questions? Sustained. Did you have some questions for them at the end? I did. Did you feel like you had a choice in answering their questions? Objection well sustained. Man, that day, you came to the sheriff's department to get your phone? That's, yes. Did you know that you were gonna be placed in custody? I did not. Did you know that you were going to be arrested? I did not. Did you know that you were going to be questioned? I did not. Were you trying to cooperate with law enforcement based on her statements that you have to talk to us? Yes. Overall. Were you there answering her questions because she confirmed that this was normal protocol? my understanding is yes. that's all the questions I have. any cross-examination yes, so that afternoon on february 24th of 2020 when deputy kayla rodriguez arrived at your residence shortly after 1 p.m you were under the influence of alcohol correct yes you were impaired by alcohol correct i don't know as much as impaired means it did affect yes okay and that was consumption from the night before, correct? Yes. So you did not go to brunch that morning and have mimosas or anything else to drink, correct? Okay. And you consumed no alcohol in your home that morning, correct? Okay. So does that affect in any way your memory when you testify about the events that transpired between you and Detective Copsel that afternoon? Ask one more time, please. Did the alcohol have any effect on your memory of what happened between you and Detective Copsel that afternoon? Now or then? Then. Did alcohol affect my conversation with her? There's a jury instruction that says a witness's memory and perception is pertinent. And I'm asking you, did the alcohol that you were under the influence of affect your memory or perception of the events that you've testified to today that you said happened on that afternoon of February 24th, 2020? Um, so did they affect um, my answer? Judge, I don't think she understands. I don't. Okay. It's been asked three different ways. So we'll leave it at you were under the influence of alcohol that afternoon, correct? Judge, I think she, I think she said she doesn't know what, she, she said that she had alcohol under the influence or impaired. The objection is, uh, the court does not entertain speaking objections. The legal grounds need to be provided. What are the legal grounds of your objection? I know that she, she had said she didn't know what it What are the legal grounds of your objection? All right, you may proceed. All right. And you understand that you're charged with second degree murder in this case, correct? Yeah. You're facing a potential penalty of life in prison, correct? Yeah. Do you understand that the score sheet minimum is probably about 22 and a half years? I, I don't know. Okay. And it is your desire to have these statements excluded from the jury's uh, consideration, correct? Judge, I, I would object to that. Sustain the objection. Your intent is to testify differently than you have testified in the statements in States Exhibit 1, correct? I would object to that. I'm not understanding what the question. Mr. J. Judge, um, a witness's bias is always at issue when they take the stand, and it's our position that um, her credibility for all the things that she has testified to today, that particularly the things in conflict with Detective Copsel's testimony, and the court, of course, in a motion to suppress, has to consider the credibility of the witnesses, and you are in the best position to do that. The appellate courts are going to be very deferential to you. It's our position that she's biased. She is charged with second-degree murder. She's facing life in prison. Based on the uh, examination that both state attorneys and defense counsel and the state's expert uh, 
witness today. It is the state's belief that she is intending to testify differently than she testified in the statements that she provided to law enforcement in States Exhibit 1. And therefore, she is biased in all the things that she's testified about today because it is her intent to get this statement, um, all these statements, uh, or the statement on 225 thrown out um, so that she is not going to be cross-examined, impeached with it, so that she can testify the way that she testified this afternoon. Response. Church, I agree with the impeachment about being under the influence. I agree with the impeachment about what she's facing, that she may be biased because she's facing potentially life in prison, he claims 22 years on the low end. I, I agree with all that. Uh, we just got through at the jail uh, meeting with the state's expert who evaluated Sarah Boone. I was present. Uh, the two prosecutors were present. It wasn't recorded. He can't be a witness now if he's going to question her about what was said during that evaluation. And he's putting himself potentially to be a witness down the road. I don't think that's proper cross examination about what she said there versus what he's saying here. Anything that's further, Mr. J? I am not specifically asking her what she said that was different. Um, and obviously, if I did and uh, she testified differently, I would have to accept that answer. There's no way for me to e extrinsically uh, impeach her with that due to the brevity of the time frame that we have all been subjected to. Um, but I do believe it's a fair question to ask her whether or not she intends to testify differently um, than her statements that are in States Exhibit 1 and consistently with how she testified this afternoon and that she understands it would benefit her if these statements are excluded. So I'm going to sustain the objection based on how the question was asked. I'll allow you to revisit it based on how you just explained it to me. <clears throat> you gave uh, statements to an, an evaluator this afternoon, did you not? I did. All right. And without going into the details, um, would you agree that there are some differences in those statements as to what is in the statements you provided to law enforcement on February 25th of 2020? Yes. And you understand that I would be able to cross-examine you on giving inconsistent statements at trial if you take the stand, correct? I understand. And so you understand the benefit of this motion to suppress being granted? Of course. Okay. No other questions? Any redirect examination? Okay, um, we can have Ms. Boone return back to council's table. While she's in the process of returning to council's table, anything else further from an evidence or testimony perspective from your side of the ledger? Yes. Okay, anything else from the state other than argument? Just argument. Okay, all right. Once Ms. Boone's seated, we could proceed with any argument. And as the court identified previously, I have reviewed <clears throat> all y'all's authorities that were provided. Mr. Owens, it's your motion, sir. You may proceed. Judge, my understanding of the law regarding Miranda, first issue is was the defendant in custody, was the suspect in custody? Was it a custodial interrogation? We have agreed or stipulated to that fact. We're referring to the two hour interrogation at the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Specifically, we're referring to about the first minute or two of that video. And I think under the totality of the circumstances, the court has to determine whether freely and voluntarily and knowingly given under the circumstances. Judge law enforcement, after they get a valid waiver of rights, that I'm not going to be silent, that I'm going to answer questions. Go ahead, ask me and I'll answer the questions. Once that happens, law enforcement is trying to get a confession. Law enforcement is trying to get admissions that they can later use at trial 
to impeach the defendant and convict him. The law allows law enforcement at that stage to use deception, to lie, to trick. We found the murder weapon. It's got your DNA on it. Your co-defendant has come in here and confessed and implicated you. All those, technique, all those techniques, when it's really deception, they don't have the DNA, they don't have the murder weapon, they don't have the co-defendant, can be utilized to obtain a confession or an admission of guilt. But prior to Miranda, you cannot deceive. Prior to Miranda, you cannot trick. That right is fundamental. You cannot be compelled to incriminate yourself. You cannot be forced to talk. It's got to be free will and a choice. And so you can't seduce or coerce someone into giving a statement. And the law is clear. When that happens, we've got to punish law enforcement to correct that type of misuse behavior. It's illegal. So you got Detective Copsell on the one hand. I got to read your rights. And you have a right to remain silent. But within a minute before, the detective is telling Sarah Boone, we have to do this. We have to talk to you. Now, that's confusing. That's deceptive. There's nowhere in policy that that should be allowed or is allowed. There's nowhere in the law that that should be allowed. It's actually illegal to tell a suspect, we have to talk to you. We just have to before reading Miranda rights. That is an illegal statement. Sarah Boone did not have to talk to them about the autopsy. Sarah Boone did not have to talk further about what had happened. But that's the implication this detective gave Sarah Boone. It taints the Miranda that comes before it. Here's a law enforcement officer. I'm trying to cooperate. We've got to talk to you, but you have a right to remain silent. But the statement of we have to read you the rights was made before we have to talk to you. So your argument transposes those two things chronologically. Why are we even having it? I mean, why even have the confusion? I mean, we're sitting here Monday morning quarterbacking, but Sarah Boone was brought up there under false pretenses. A traumatic event, she lost her boyfriend. I'm coming to get my phone. I've been tricked into coming up here to get my phone. And I'm sitting here having to figure out what, what to do about whether to talk to these people or not. And she's talking about my rights, but then saying, we have to talk to you. We just need to do it. And then she reads the rights. Right there within a few seconds of each other. That's improper, it's illegal, it's coercive. It forces this not to be a valid waiver of her rights under that circumstance. Coupled with the fact that they came down, she came down under false pretenses. Coupled with the fact she doesn't have the ninth question. If you think about it, okay, you got a right to remain silent, you got a right to a lawyer, those, those three or four questions, and then 
do you understand what I've just read to you? I'm paraphrasing. But then Detective Copsell goes right into questioning. Once Sarah says, yes, I understand, it's an acquiesce to authority. Okay, let me start asking her questions. The critical question is, having these rights in mind, do you agree to speak with us? That is the time of free choice. That is the time of decision for Sarah to be given that opportunity. But the way detect it, I understand, Detective Copsell had the autopsy. He had the, she had the blunt force trauma. Those were not questioned, she was not, Terrible was not questioned about that. They didn't know about that until the medical examiner. So she had additional information that she wanted from Sarah Boone. She had the two videos from Sarah Boone's phone. She had additional information from the phone that was inconsistent with the statement that Sarah had given the day before. So sure, any detective worth their salt would want a statement. She'd already said we had probable cause. We'd already made a mind up that we were gonna arrest her. They were, if she didn't come, they were gonna go get her. If she came and said, I wanna invoke my rights, she was gonna be arrested. They wanted to get some type of admission, confession, statement that they could later use, which they're trying to do now. But under the circumstances, the totality of the circumstances about how she was induced to come down there, about telling them that she had to talk, judge, it was coercive. We would ask that you suppress the evidence. Any response? Judge, the United States Supreme Court has said that confessions are good. They are good for society. It is good when guilty people are convicted. We stand by all the case law that we've cited, um, and you have reviewed the evidence from start to finish under the totality of the circumstances of that two hour and six minute statement that she gave to law enforcement. She knowingly and intelligently and voluntarily waived her Miranda rights. And under the case law, it was done perfectly fine. There is no requirement that uh, that question number nine get read. Um, and as far as any credibility issues that are pertinent um, to the court's analysis, which the state would submit there is not, because we are conceding there was custody on February 25th, they are allowed to use subterfuge and deception to get somebody to come to the police station under the case law and authority cited. Um, but if there is anything that is dependent upon the credibility of either the defendant's testimony or Detective Culpsell's testimony, the state would argue for the reasons um, of or being impaired by her own admission on the afternoon of February 24th, still from the night before, um, that her credibility is less than Detective Cupsell's. And of course, she has a bias and interest in the outcome of the case, whereas Detective Cupsell has no motivation to not tell the truth about whether she used deception to bring the defendant down to the police station, because that's perfectly acceptable. So we're asking you for the reasons that we stated in our multiple responses to their multiple amended motions to deny their motion to suppress. Thank you. Any further argument, Mr. Owens? No, Judge. All right. Um, tomorrow is a court holiday. The court has had the opportunity to review all the case law. Court's going to prepare a written order, and you'll have it before the close of business tomorrow. Courthouse may be closed, but I'll be here working. Judge, for the record, there's two exhibits that I tried to introduce. They will be admitted Correct. to the record. Yes, of course. They were pre-marked. Moving now to the defendant's motion for a right to hair, cosmetics, and civilian clothing uh, without restraints for trial. Um, state what, if any, positions do you have with regard to the restraints? Again, we've already decided that issue. I don't know that there's been any new allegations alleged in the motions by Mr. Owens on behalf of the defendant, but the court has decided that already. And unless there was some sort of change in position or authority, and the court should maintain the law of the case. Response. And just, just no clarification, but you know, she's, she's here today and she's in handcuffs. So she has difficulty writing. She has- Let me just interject for one second. She will be hands-free. Okay. So the issue is the light restraints. And, and judge, she's presumed innocent. 
Um, I understand security has an obligation. There's three doors. I assume we're going to be trying the case in this yes, courtroom. Sir. There's three doors. Uh, I know that we've got several security officers here in case she were to try to flee. Um, but she's got no access to weapons or anything of that nature. Um, she has a fundamental right to a fair trial. She has the fundamental right to a presumption of innocence. And if the jury were to see any restraints on her freedom, they're going to automatically assume the worst, that she is a danger. And they, people automatically will take that to heart and it will affect their decision when they go back into the jury room. So, yeah, she's going to be at the table. I, I don't know if we switch it. To the, does the prosecutor go? No, that's, that's your table, sir. That's my table. Closest to the jury. So she'll be sitting here with the other two lawyers and I. And um, the only time they're going to see her walk in and out is going to, she's always going to be in the courtroom. They're never going to see her walk in and out. So the, the only time is when she testifies. So I guess that only, I don't know if you have leg restraints that she can wear and walk, but we believe it's not necessary. And of course, we definitely don't want uh, them to see her walking funny or hear something funny or see something funny as she's walking from the defense table to the witness stand to testify on her own behalf. But I don't think it's necessary to have leg restraints. I think once she gets in here in the trial, beginning Monday, jury selection, and I, s I assume the tables are going to stay here. The privacy panels will be located in front as well, which will prohibit our jury from being able to see any of the leg restraints that she has. I don't think it's necessary to have the leg restraints, Judge. I think you can bring her in with the leg restraints, but take them off right before we get started. I, I don't see a problem with that. I, I don't think she's a threat. You know, there are times when criminal defendants are in a trial and they misbehave in the middle of the trial. So they have to be restrained. But Sarah Boone, as far as I've been involved, and I think prior to that time, has always been polite and cooperative, and um, she understands the importance of behaving, and I have every intent that she will comply with the court's directive and she will act appropriately throughout the trial. I do not believe any restraints are necessary during this trial. Anything further as to that issue? I don't believe that's case law authority on the issue. Okay, please. All right, thank you very much. Um, with regard to your request for clothing in that, um, you could certainly go to the jail uh, and provide, uh, have whoever it is that you want to meet with her in the, in the meeting area to provide, get measurements from her and provide clothing. The clothing for trial will have to be provided to her at the Orange County Jail. Uh, that will be brought over with her in the morning uh, and then she'll be able to be dressed out downstairs. Um, so I don't, I don't, your motion will be granted with regard to the clothing. You'll have to address with the jail, having a person come in there to take her measurements. They may have to be with you counselor, uh, in order to facilitate that, but the clothing will have to be dropped off at the jail and it will be transported with her in the morning, uh, each day of trial. Okay. Um, with regard to the uh, appearance issue, do you have any other further argument as to that? Judge, just, just what's stated in the, um, you know, I made some legal arguments in the defendant's motion for the right to hair, cosmetics, civilian clothing without restraints for trial. Just, just the arguments in there. And the Estelle case that you spoke to, you cited to, spoke to being dressed out in, in a prison garb. Doesn't really address a prison garden shackles. It doesn't address any beautification or anything along those lines. I, I just think it's, you know, it's just part of a fair trial. The other problem is, is it's contraband. That stuff's not even purchasable at the commissary at, at the jail, any makeup or anything along those lines. Well, we're gonna, I'm gonna have the two paralegals here. Um, I, I say the paralegals, uh, one's, one's a lawyer now and the other is a consultant, but um, they're females. And they can they can bring it the cosmetics in and apply it either here in the courtroom or just outside the courtroom. I'm sure there's a waiting room. There's there's no place where we can apply any. You can't put them back there because they there's no we can't allow access back there. That's for corrections and for the sheriff's department and for the inmates. Can she be allowed? Can the can the uh, the two females on the team can they can they be allowed to apply some type of makeup to Miss Smith? State. We don't have any dog in this fight. I just, 
I've never heard of it happening. That doesn't mean it's not permissible, but if you want to try to do it here in the courtroom, that's fine. But be advised that you know when we start court, we start court. So and and I intend on starting it at nine o'clock every morning. So I'll have pleas every morning and other matters because the court still has other business at eight forty-five, and I plan on bringing the jury up at nine uh, until we select one, and then starting at nine every day thereafter. So your motion will be granted with regard to the clothing. You can perhaps someone attend um, uh, travel to the jail with you, sir, Mr. Owens, to take the measurements. You'll have to provide clothing at the jail. With regard to the appearance, it's denied to have anything happen at the jail or happen in any of the secured areas. But if you want to attempt to have members of your staff uh, apply uh, makeup prior to trial, you certainly can do so. Court will provide you a written order with regard to the request to removal of the leg restraints. But the hand restraints will be removed. I think that it, it, it falls under the same okay. analysis. It needs to be done in the courtroom. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and then the last item teed up for today is the, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yes. So corrections in the Orange County Sheriff's Office have just advised me that the concern is is if makeup is affixed and then she's taken back downstairs and then taken back to the Orange County Jail, they don't know if it's contraband, they don't know what's placed on her person. And that's the concern. It's just gonna be some facial makeup. I understand, but I don't I don't see DOC and 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 sheriff's officer telling me they can't do it because of the concerns that were just outlined after she's returned to the Orange County Jail facility. All right. You'll get an order with regard to the restraints no later than tomorrow. Moving now to the state's request for protective order. I've reviewed that. I need more. I need to understand what you're looking at, Mr. Owens, with regard to these custodians and supervisors at the state attorney's office. I, I did not realize that was going to be addressed today. Yes, my J.A. had emailed all y'all, I think last week after it was filed that said this would be added to the hearing for, I guess that was filed on Monday, forgive me. I had emailed y'all and said that it would be addressed today. <clears throat> that was relating to me subpoenaing the enlisting the, the uh, I think it was the. It's the, the third amended witness list lists certain people as witnesses, custodian of records, Orange County, Office of State Attorney, Domestic Violence Supervisor for the Office of the State Attorney, Victim Advocate Supervisor for the Office of the State Attorney, and Misdemeanor Supervisor for the Office of the State Attorney. And the state is seeking a protective order on the grounds that it's work product or opinion product uh, and requiring prosecutors to um, disclose work product and impede criminal prosecutions is, is violative of Florida law. But as you know, um, we have filed our notice of intent for battered spouse syndrome in conjunction with um, self-defense. And we have listed and plan to introduce the fact that George Torres had been arrested, I think three or four times prior to this event. And I think on three of those cases, uh, the case was dismissed against uh, Mr. Torres. And it's gonna come out that Sarah Boone had requested the charges be dismissed and I believe it's gonna come out probably through expert testimony that that's one of the conditions or that's one of the things that they try to do, bond you out of jail and then get the charges dismissed as a battered spouse. That's a common theme. So ultimately the jury is gonna hear about that, but the jury needs to know it's the ultimate position. The victim doesn't have the final say. It's the ultimate position from the state attorney's office as to whether to prosecute a case or to drop a case. Yes, they are to consider what the victim wants and they are to consider their request, but ultimately uh, the state attorney has to make that decision about whether a case is dismissed. What are you gonna be asking from these persons? That. How would that not be protected by work product? 
well, as to whether or not it, it was it a comes decision. Out, if it comes out that she went down there and requested the charges be dropped and they were dropped, then that gives the impression that she had the power and authority just to come down to the state attorney and ask the charges to be dropped and they would. When in fact, the ultimate call is the state attorney's office. They don't have to drop cases, even if a victim claims they do. So just that decision by the state attorney to drop it was their decision. They considered the victims, but it was their decision to drop it and their power and authority to do so, not the victim's authority. Okay. Response? That's opinion work product. That is absolutely protected. Um, I don't understand why he believes that arrests and dismissals are relevant. What is relevant in a self-defense case is if the defendant is aware of specific instances of violence that the uh, victim has committed or reputation evidence that can come in from anybody and it does not matter whether the defendant's aware of it. Uh, the notion that this sort of evidence would be admissible, much less through the vessel of sworn prosecutors, and they have now gone ahead and named people who aren't even involved with the cases, uh, um, Matthew Storch, Christina Mills, and um, Aaron McCullough, our head victim advocate, have all now, uh, I learned while we were at the jail this afternoon, been served with subpoenas by the defense, and we are moving to quash those. Um, Prosecutors and victim advocates and other support staff cannot be forced to come in and say why they dropped a case. That is opinion work product. And if they want to get public records about these cases and try to get them moved into evidence, then they have to do public records requests or compel discovery from the state attorney's office, which I believe we all have. I believe, I mean, the state has just been dropped with her medical records that Investigator Lane got in 2021, even though they keep on saying in their amended discovery exhibits that they don't even have this evidence. We got dropped last Friday the Aspire records and the Advent Health records um, that have documentation that Billy Lane picked them up in 2021. So the defendants had these things that are getting dropped on the state for years and were just getting dropped on us this Friday. And now we are having to combat subpoenas and requests for documents, um, it is opinion work product. The people that they have listed didn't handle those cases or make those decisions, but that is the ultimate protection is why we drop these cases. And it's, it's up to defendant if she wants to come in and say, yeah, I asked to, to get these cases dropped. I mean, that evidence is coming in anyways through her phone extraction. She is, uh, immediately working to bail the victim out. She's immediately working on dropping charges. In fact, there's a video of her coaching the victim on how to drop charges against her on her phone. Um, so all that evidence is going to come in, but it cannot be coming in through opinion work product of the uh, assistant state attorneys and, and our support staff. Any further argument? Uh, I, I didn't make the argument. I did not make the argument that the state attorney was going to be called to ask why they dropped it, as he just referred to, where they had to explain why the case was dismissed. No, the reason for that is just to explain that they have the ultimate power to dismiss, not, not the victim in a case. Not why we chose to drop three cases against George Torres, but they have the ultimate authority. The victim does not control the case. The state attorney does. You have a written order on the motion protective order for tomorrow as by tomorrow as well. Anything else state we need to address? It appears, uh, and again, I've been conducting motions all afternoon. It appears that we are set to allow the defense to depose our battered spouse syndrome expert at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah. And that will be done virtually. With regard to the deposition of Dr. Brannon, the deadline is tomorrow. That's set at 3 p.m. Okay, that's still set at 3 p.m. Yes, there will likely be a pending motion to strike if his testimony is duplicative um, with Dr. Harper's. Uh, my understanding from the defense is he's just going to explain what battered spouse syndrome is. Uh, it's unclear why or how that would be different than Dr. Harper explaining that. Is that taking place here or is that taking place virtually. in South Florida? Virtually. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I cannot 
be everywhere at all times. Okay. All right. Judge, and then on Dr. Brandon's deposition, yes, it's set for three. I'm just learning now that uh, the expert is going to be available at 10. All experts work by Zoom. And we did talk about that at the jail, trying to schedule something for tomorrow. So she just evaluated Sarah Boone from noon to 2. And then I'm going to take her deposition at 10 tomorrow morning by Zoom. Um, and then we're taking Dr. Brandon's deposition. If they file some type of motion about that, then of course I'm going to respond. We're going to need to have a hearing on that. Okay. If, go ahead. I'm sorry. Those two things are the only two things that I believe we have left uh, prior to jury selection on Monday. Okay. If any motions are filed by anyone moving forward, please favor a copy to my judicial assistant upon filing. And if there's any authority that you intend on arguing that's not cited in the motion, please provide me that authority as well. Although it is a court holiday, the court will be working tomorrow. I will endeavor to get you written orders on all of these things no later than the close of business, hopefully earlier than that by tomorrow. On Monday morning, state if you could please bring a copy of the score sheet so that when I colloquy Ms. Boone prior to trial about the charge, the potential penalties, everybody's on the same page as to what those are. Okay? Yes. And if y'all could send me that, I'll go out to the jail. I'm going to be here. If you could favor him a copy of that tomorrow or Friday so that he has the opportunity to review that score sheet with Ms. Boone in advance. Yes, and then we're going to be filing a motion in Lemonade to exclude the battered spouse syndrome testimony that will need to be addressed. Just waiting to see now how the depositions pan out tomorrow, but based on what we witnessed this afternoon, it's the state's position that we're going to need to file a motion. Okay, all right, appreciate it. All right, thank you all very much. We'll address scheduling of any motions on Monday, and it may be a circumstance where, as the court had identified earlier, that we're just going to be looking at cause issues and what people may know about this case. That'll have, be happening before we turn it over to you all, uh, which would include, Mr. Owens, your opportunity to voir dire on any defenses that may be being raised in this case. So it may be we may get a panel and then ask them to come back later in the week so that we can have those motions after we get that panel of, of 50 once we deal with all the cost challenges. Okay? All right, thank you all very much. We'll see you Monday morning at 9 a.m. Courts in recess, thank you. <clears throat>